gentleman who raised it, but it came up after Shear, which was the role and the attitude of Judaism towards women. And I figured I'd like to expand on that a, bit, a little bit tonight. And um, it's not uh, directly related to say, say for Shoftim, so uh, since I'm substituting tonight for somebody else, so therefore I have an excuse tonight. Other nights I don't have an excuse, but tonight I do have an excuse for it. So I want to start with what uh, says more or less what Rabbi Arya Kaplan says on the topic. And um, one thing which we have to start out with defining is the difference between masculine and feminine, or male and female, versus man and woman. Now, but, but there are certain traits which the Torah associates with being masculine. And there are certain traits which the Torah associates with being feminine, but not all males are masculine, and not all females are feminine. Right? So there isn't necessarily a perfect mesh or congruence between being a man and being masculine and being a woman and being feminine. So far so good? Is that relatively clear? Okay. The masculine traits are the traits of which extend, out, extend outwards and the feminine traits are the traits which contract inwards or sometimes receive from elsewhere. So, on the one hand, the first thing the Torah tells men is go and conquer the world. You should go out and you should conquer the world. He says the world is given to you in order to conquer it, in order to sub subjugate it. Man is given the task to extend himself and put himself out on a mission in order to extend the godliness which God implanted into him into the world. The feminine is that which either receives that, uh, that, that uh, influence or builds on that influence. And uh, the building on the influence is not by extension but by contemplation. Now, let me explain that which is the, I, the term for a male in Hebrew is a zohar. The term for a female is a nekeva. Zohar is related cognately to the word zecher. Zecher means memory. Rabbi Kaplan writes that memory, the males represent memory and the past, and fem females, again, masculine, I should say, represent f f uh, fem the, the past and memory, and women represent the future and building towards the future. Now, the reason why this is so is because the past is supposed to extend towards and influence the future. That's the major thrust of Judaism, is there's this past which stretches back to Mount Sinai, which is supposed to impact upon and tr transform the future. The future, uh, on the other hand, is that which is, doesn't have that impact on the past, for the most part. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The future is the impacted upon because the past has occurred. The future cannot impact on the past because it hasn't yet come to pass. So therefore, it's the, few, the, the uh, memory or the past which extends into and shapes the future. Now, I say more, most of the time, there's a very important Reb Tzadik, very Yisraelistic Reb Tzadik, and it relates directly to our topic of this evening. Reb Tzadik says that Rosh, Rosh Chodesh is different than any other holiday in the Jewish calendar. It's a Torah, it's a Torah calendar holiday. But it's different than any other holiday. That all other holidays represent the past and celebrate some event in the past, whereas Rosh Chodesh celebrates the future. What, in other words, Pesach, Sukkot, Shavuos, they commemorate things which already happened. What? Rosh Hashanah well, also does. Hayom Aras Olam. Today is the day in which the first judgment occurred in the time of Adam. 
You can write in the right book for the future. That's, that's a separate issue. In other words, you actually have the judgment that is for the future, but the day commemorates the past. The, um, so uh, Yom, Yom Kippur is the questionable one, but Yom Kippur also, that was the day in which Moshe Rabbeinu came down with the second tablets. Every, every day has an association. But Rosh Chodesh doesn't. Rosh Chodesh, says Reb Tzodek, actually represents the future because it represents the Pasuk which says, Every month, people will make a pilgrimage to come visit HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yushalayim. The entire world will come up to Yushalayim every Rosh Chodesh. I don't know, you know, it's great for the hotel business. But uh, the entire world, I'm not sure literally all the world, but certainly whatever is good for business is good for the Jews. But uh, everybody's going to come up to Yushalayim in order to come up on the pilgrimage. So therefore, this part that says in Tzadik, Rosh Chodesh represents the future. And that's why all the other Yom Tovim are much more stringent, are much more weighty than Rosh Chodesh, because something which has already taken place has more of an impact than something which has not yet taken place. He says that that's why, and I don't see this, but this is what he says. He says, the closer we get to the ultimate redemption, the more Rosh Chodesh becomes the Yom Tov. Meaning, people celebrate Rosh Chodesh to a greater extent the closer we get to Mashiach. Now, this dovetails very much with the, the correlation of women to Rosh Chodesh. We know that women are associated with Rosh Chodesh. Women have a custom to not do as much work on Rosh Chodesh as they do the rest of the uh, week. Rosh Chodesh represents the celebration of the moon. The moon is, it receives from the sun. It was supposed to be, the, the, it's the, um, had there not been the sin of, uh, of Adam, that the sun and the moon would be the same size. You all know the, 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 um, the uh, Chazal, the Medrash, which says that the moon came to Hashem and said, you know, that you can't have two big luminaries. So Hashem said, you know what, you go and diminish yourself. You guys all familiar with that? Right. So you know what I'm going to say. That not necessarily, it's not necessarily to be taken literally. That the sun was, the, the moon actually came in front of Hashem and had this conversation. Yeah. But it, well, what, uh, it could mean that. <laughs> but it's not necessarily the case. What it means is that, according to Rabari Kaplan, is that the... It, there was a premise that both past and future should equally influence the present. In other words, if man, if to man was revealed the future, everybody was a prophet, then both past and future would influence the present. The decision was that's not going to be the case. There's going to be a diminution of the moon. The, and that will ensure much more free will but it will also ensure, of course, much more darkness, spiritual darkness in the world. Because if you can't see the future, then you have to take it on some degree of faith. Perhaps it's logical, but it's still a measure of faith that there is going to be a redemption, and there is going to be a Mashiach, and there is going to be a third base on Mikdash. But it's something which you take on faith because the past indicates that it's going to be the future. You don't see the future itself. The... Um, so therefore, the, the, uh, it says in Chazal that, I think it's Gemara, I forget where, that uh, there's, an, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a public chatos, a public sin offering brought on Rosh Chodesh. That public sin offering, Hashem said, bring for me an atonement. It says, chatos la Hashem. doesn't say that any other Yom Tovim, a sin offering for God. Here it says sin offering for God. Why? So Hashem says, bring upon me an atonement that I diminish the moon. Now this is a very, very strange chazal, right? That God requires an atonement because he diminished the moon. First of all, he's God. Who's he atoning to, right? Secondly, uh, uh, what's the problem? What's so bad about diminishing the moon? This is not what kind of sin is involved? So this is a very deep and profound chazal. We could spend... Weeks and weeks and weeks just giving different approaches towards understanding this chazal. And I can't do that right now. 
but it's going to give you one of many. Oh, okay, you want to? Fine. The, uh, I can give you one, of, one possible approach for now. Rav Dessler, by the way, sp- speaks about this at great length and very beautifully. But, um, one, but one approach which we'll take today is that a, an atonement, a korban in and of itself means closeness, right? It means to close a gap. A kapora means, when, uh, 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 when we bring a korban for kapora, it means to cover up. And we, I don't know if cover up is the right word, but to sweep, to, to, to push away the sin, which is a barrier between myself and Hashem. The, uh, uh, it is supposed to go and restore, come to restore the relationship between us. There, when, when Hashem made the moon smaller, he, what he did was he distanced himself from creation. He, he, he may, he's the sun, so to speak. And the moon was supposed to be, could have been, a co-equal partner with Hashem. And of the same level and stature. Hashem could have made man much more overtly divine than he did. But Hashem, for reasons which are uh, best known to him, but we can understand to a certain extent, decided that that's not the way to go. Man should not be given that measure of greatness because man could use it to be haughty. Just like the moon's intent of that medrash was to come and say, diminish the sun, not me. He should be diminished, right? So therefore, man... Sorry? Can reach the potential, though? Can reach the potential? Yes, but it's much more difficult. The, um, so, the, so the moon... It was diminished in order for man to be not as powerful as he could possibly be, and also in order that there should be a cycle, just like the moon cycles through waxing and waning, waxing and waning, there should be a cyclical history, this cyclical course of history, which things go up and down and up and down. Why is that way? For many reasons. Among them, makes life much more exciting. But the idea is that it should not be a constancy like it is by the sun. That's why Chazal say the sun represents the non-Jews who count to the sun. And the moon represents the Jews who count their months by the moon. And the, the, the sti- who count uh, their calendar by the moon. So this distinction being by the non-Jews there's a certain degree of static, of remaining static. Meaning that they're either up or down. They're not up and down and up and down and up and down, right? When they're up, they're up. When they're down, they're down. Whereas by the Jews, they go up and down and up and down and up and down. And this, this is rep- and they are always contingent on how they relate to the sun, how they relate to Hashem. That's what makes them either greater or makes them lesser. Either makes them more radiant or less radiant. It's another purpose, which is that the moon, when the sun is out, so it, there's revelation. The moon is what reflects the sun's revelation in darkness. So to the Jewish people, it's supposed to be the reflection of Hashem, the illumination of Hashem reflected into this world. We are bringing that illumination into this world. That's our purpose. Now, the moon and sun also. Sun and moon are also associated with man and woman. Uh, uh, the, it says that the sun, we say this in Sukkot de Zimra, Shabbos morning, v'hu kechosan yotze mi He's like a, the sun is like a chosan, like a groom coming out of his chupa. And we say in Kiddush Levana, uh, that the, 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 the moon is a teresti feris na musei botan, shem asim is chadesh kmosot. This is uh, the, the, uh, 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 a glory for those who are, uh, our musei botan means those who are, no, how does the article translate that? Before I give my own translation, it might be wrong. Um, is there an article sitting here somewhere? Hapshel. 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 Not the article is necessarily right, but 
If this tape ever gets back to my boss, I apologize for that. I was just joking. Um, <laughs> Here, it says, to the moon he said that it should renew itself as a crown of splendor for those who are born by him from the womb, those who are destined to renew themselves like it. So the Jewish, uh, the Jewish nation, there's a reference here to the womb because of the, not just because you, that Am Yisrael was like born, so to speak, in the womb of God, but also because there's an allusion here to the feminine aspect. The feminine aspect is the aspect of the moon which receives and reflects the light of the sun. So the light of the, the moon represents, again, the woman. Rosh Chodesh is the renewal of the moon. That's a Rosh Chodesh is taken by women to be their holiday. And that's why women seem to, to celebrate Rosh Chodesh more than men. And the closer we get to the redemption, the more Rosh Chodesh becomes a holiday. Why? Because the closer we get to the redemption, the closer we get to the time when the curse which Adam, which was bestowed on Adam and Chava, is eliminated. Now, what were the curses the curse bestowed on Adam and Chava? The curses bestowed upon them were for man, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to eat bread. For woman, Bets of Tel Dibonim, you're going to give birth in, in agony. Vuhuim Shalbach, and your husband is going to rule over you. So, this Pasuk is indicating what the course of history was going to be from the time of the sin and forwards until the end of time. But as we get closer to the end of time, the curses begin to dissipate and to dissolve. And that's why we have, as we get closer to redemption, we have less work to do in order to make our daily bread. By less work, I mean we don't have to go out and actually sweat in the fields, although if you like to, I think it's healthy. But you, don't have, you, don't have, you can just sit in your office, grow fat, and make lots of money that way. So, the, uh, so you don't have to actually go out and toil in the fields. What? Unless you're a farmer, right? And also women don't, uh, we have wonderful anesthetics nowadays which help women give birth in less pain. You think that that's not a bracha that's from Hashem? It's certainly a bracha from Hashem that such a thing exists. And as we get closer to the ultimate redemption, women sense that the time to throw the shackles of men off of them is coming closer. Now, some people sense it in a very negative way. I see you have some questions already. Yes. Okay, so Shia, you already had it. Wait, Shia has had it before. Oh, uh, I just wanted to know how, how like, the toilet in the Torah uh, comes out when the days come close to redemption. Like, Sorry? You, said you, can either you choose either toil or in Hanat, like into, you know, you can either toil and, like, say, farm or something, you can toil in Torah. So. Did I say that? No, I'm saying it says, it says the Pazal says that, no? No. 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 No, Rav Shimbay Chai says that, but we don't pass him like him. Yeah. Okay, so another one of the curses given to Abraham is that he should die. So does it mean that we're going to be like mortal? Yeah. We're working on it. I mean, life expectancy has gone up, I think, 30 or 40 years in the last century. Yeah. There's a there's, uh, there's specific amount of whether whether the, the moon is waxing or waning on that month, does that say something specific to Israel during that period of time? Um, yes. That's why most Jewish holidays are on the 15th day of the month. Because that is the, what's the word, the, the, the acme, right? The, the apex, thank you. The apex, the zenith, good, okay. The apex or zenith of the lunar cycle. So each month, it's, essence is at the 15th day of that month. And each month obviously is a different essence, right? That's why, you know, Tisha B'Av, we, we, we like to think of as not the core day of Av, but rather Tuba which is a much happier day. Okay? Yeah? 
Um, people discuss how we're going to be living longer and like in this direction towards immortality. But no one seems to address the fact that a lot of the characters in the Bible live hundreds of years, and we don't. So. I yeah, they're, they're, we don't know why the difference occurred, except that we know we see that after the flood, the world got less and less hospitable. So we, I don't know if that we're going to be able to reverse that because we managed, you know, there's a little plug for ecology and a, a less of a carbon footprint. We managed to ruin the world very much on our own and make it a less hospitable place, right? That so it's not just enough to extend life bi biologically. Biomedically, one has to also extend life in terms of the environment. I don't know if and when that's going to happen. We're talking about bar miracles, no, without miracles being involved, just in a, natu in a natural progression. So I'm not sure how that would happen. Yeah? You said that um, when the moon will be become more blessed or we will appreciate the moon more, that is the time of Dula. So the question is, how has the blessing of the moon changed in the last couple of centuries? What do you mean? Uh, you said that if it becomes more blessed, then it's time for Geola. But how has it changed? Not the moon, no, Rosh Chodesh. Okay, so Rosh Chodesh. If Rosh Chodesh, the Pishim Moyes. How has it changed in the last couple of centuries? I haven't seen I don't see it. Rip Sodok saw it. I don't see it. I think women see it. Because women, said, women, are, women celebrate it to a much greater extent. Men, men I, don't, I don't see how you see it in a man's life. I really don't. But, you know, for Absodic thought, there must be something to it. Yeah? Are you gonna, um, this question, I don't know if it's the right time to ask it, but uh, I wanted to know, my sister, she asked this, uh, that blessing we do every day. In the we're getting there. Okay. okay. I'm not sure we're going to get there. Tonight might be tomorrow night, okay. but we're on our way to that blessing. Just, we're we're, we're going to get there. One other thing, is yeah. there a reason, do you know, that sometimes... I get the feeling I look at the moon, not only does it, it change, like sometimes it just looks so close to us. Is there, a, is that specific, uh, do you know any reason for that? Like it looks so, so bigger than it was and it sometimes looks so far away. And, when it's closer to the sun, it looks bigger. It looks very big when it rises. Mm -hmm. When it rises close to sunset. It looks lo much larger than life. It's much larger than it looks in the middle of the night. That, I think that there's a, a symbolism in that. But even in the middle of the night, I see, like uh, I saw last week during like the yeah. nine ish o'clock, it was like it was gigantic, mm. much more than there. It could be, I don't know, but it's quite possible, you know, if you were, if you looked into it, you could find something in the literature which discusses that. Mm. Yeah? Why is it that the redemption takes place between the Jewish woman? Uh, we'll come to that. It's a good question. Yeah? He said that when the, when the, when the Hashem did decrease the moon's size, it was like he's distancing away. The moon, right? But if the moon is the Jewish people, he did some stuff from the Jewish people. Of course. So that's what you mean, like he just yeah. He's less revealed to us, or yeah. So is he more revealed to the goyim? I mean, because the sun is huge. I mean, what? No, he's not necessarily more revealed to the goyim because the goyim in this world get the revelation through us. Okay. But uh, uh, they're on a different level. When I said not, the sun represents the non-Jews, it's on a different level. Not because they have more light, but because they don't wax and wane. It's not the same process, process. Yes, but of course, when we say, so what, when Hashem says, getting back to the matter itself, when Hashem says, bring for me an atonement, because I diminished the moon, what he's saying is, okay, guys, so now what you, the, I distanced you for a reason. That from that distance, you should come closer to me. And the way you'll come closer to me is by being carbonos. Now, this might not seem fair, but that's the way God made the world that we, he pushed us away in order that we should then find the way to come closer to him ourselves. And every Rosh Chodesh, when the moon lunar cycle starts again, that symbolizes our quest to come closer to Hashem. That's why there used to be a minute, nobody, people don't keep it so much anymore, there used to be a minute that people only got married during the first half of a month. Did you ever hear that? First half of a Jewish month. So this, this is before, you know, every night a catering hall was taken. So, they have, they're so, so now people get married whenever they can book a date. But once upon a time, that Allah brings down, you should only get married as the moon is waxing, not as the moon is waning. So people would only get married in the first half of a month. Okay? Not, not, so, not so long ago, people were so relatively, relatively meticulous about that. Yeah? Are you going to get back to the 
back to the thing about the women and the, the men, uh, and the men not being like over, the women not being dependent on the men and anymore. Back. Yeah, I'm going to get back to that. Yes. Okay. Should we go to the next point? Any other questions right now? Okay. So the so coming back to this idea that as we get closer to the redemption, things start changing. That means that. The, as we get closer to redemption, in essence, what's happening is that the future is becoming more and more revealed. You actually can see things happening, which either consciously or subconsciously, I should say unconsciously, you can see things happening which represent the ultimate redemption. And the, uh, the, uh, you know, the cataclysmic events of the 20th century certainly seem to reveal a divine plan bringing us closer to the redemption. According to most opinions, besides the, that of the uh, extreme Satmar Hasidim, so the, the, the flourishing of the Jewish people in the land of Israel, and the flourishing of the land of Israel in of itself, the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, is an, also an indication of coming closer to the redemption. Not that they're not going to be setbacks along the way, because it's still waxing and waning. But in an overall sense, there is a progression in that manner. Okay, now, let's talk about specifically what changes in terms of learning Torah. Okay? The, a woman is exempt from learning Torah except for the halachos which she is required to know, which are quite, quite a few. But, she is exempted from learning Torah. The uh, reason why she is exempt from learning Torah, we don't know. Oh. We have to theorize. We're going to get there. Don't worry. Be patient. So, in order to understand this, we also have to go back to the masculine and feminine versus the male and female. Their knowledge is masculine. Understanding is feminine. Knowledge is expanding your mind to grasp new things. You reach out and you take in and you and you explore and then you acquire knowledge. Understanding is contemplating and extending your knowledge into new vistas of thought, into new vistas of understanding, of course. The connection between the two, if you have knowledge and understanding, is wisdom. Wisdom is the ultimate combination of knowing a lot and understanding a lot. That makes you a wise, wise person. In Hebrew, those three things are? Chachma Bina Das. Very good. Or in Nusach Ashkenaz? They are Bina Vahaskel. Right. So the terms are interchangeable, more or less, but let's use the, 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 the Chabad terms for our purposes. The um, Chachma is knowledge. Bina is understanding. Das is wisdom. The, or, now, anything, if I study physics, there's the Chachma of physics, there's the Bina of physics, there's the Das of physics. If I study history, there's the Chachma of history, the Bina of history, and the Das of history. But if you study Torah, there's a higher level of Das. The, the, the Kabbalists talk about Das Tachton, which is just the combination of Chochman Bina, and Das Elyon, which is Ruach HaKodesh. Rashi says, why is that so uh, controversial? No, it's not. It's just like, it's hard for me enough to understand Chochman Bina Das, and then, yeah, another piece of Das, it just throws everything off. Oh, come on. It's not that difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Another one second. Another way. Like Rashi says that by B'tzalah, by Amalei also B'chochmos Funova Das, as Rashi says, Das is Ruach HaKodesh. In other words, if you become wise in Torah, then you have a higher level of perception, higher level of understanding, sometimes even prophecy. Okay, that's why a Torah sage is regarded by us as being a, a, on a higher level of functioning than just a generic regular guy. Yeah. So Chachma is, you said that's knowledge or understanding? Mm -hmm. That's knowledge. Right. And Bina is... Uh, understanding. Because I was taught, uh, when I was told different that Bina is, well maybe it's the same thing you connected to me, it's analytical, and Chachma is like a flow, you're flowing. The same thing, yeah, it's the same thing, yeah. 
the um, so now it said women have bina. They're more understanding. Women do not necessarily have to possess chokma. That's why they're not required to learn Torah. That Chazal say Noshim Daitan Kalos. Women have light das, which in one sense is to be taken to mean that they're frivolous. But according to the Kabbalistic perspective, it means that their das is not built on both Chachma and Bina. It's built just on Bina alone. They have an understanding which can make them wise, but that wisdom is not anchored in knowledge. Okay? So therefore, it's a, 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 in theory, a man can achieve a higher level of das than a woman can. On the other hand, bina, understanding, is an essential component for das. Let me, let's explain this a bit. Men are supposed to, uh, uh, mas- the masculine, not men again, masculine is more intellectual. The feminine is more emotional. Knowledge is intellectual. You gather facts. Understanding is emotional. You can only understand something if you can feel and sense it and sense why A is different than B or why B progresses from A. That's a feeling. It's an intuition. If you don't possess a a good power of intuition, you cannot understand the knowledge which you possess. You can, as most students in schools do, spit back facts. And you'll be very good at filling in tests which are totally based on memorization. You will fall apart when it comes to actually trying to understand and extrapolate from the knowledge which you possess. Most study nowadays is purely intellectual without the emotional aspect which should be present in it. So, in order to understand something, you need to have intuition. You can be understanding of somebody without being particularly knowledgeable, and it can be knowledgeable and not have the capacity to understand. You need to have the intellectual and the emotional in order to have true and complete wisdom. Is that a problem? Yeah. Why? Because I thought with knowledge and analytical skills, you can just have wisdom. No, you cannot have wisdom unless you have the, emo- uh, the emotional perspective, which, into, which is intuition. Okay, where is analyzation coming into play? What? Analysis. analysis is part, real analysis is, comes from intuition. It's just that the intuition is, experience, can be, is, is applied as opposed to me understanding you. It's applied to me understanding numbers, right? But it's the same idea of intuition. Without intuition, you can't have true wisdom. You can know lots and lots and lots. You know, there's a... Uh, I t- told you this a few weeks ago. There, sat, there, is, there was a uh, the ra- there was a famous rabbi who was um, who uh, put, put out many svarim, all of which were lousy. And uh, the Satmar Rebbe said about this rabbi that he is an amaoretz in all of shas. Now you know, you know what that means. It means he knows all of shas, and in every single page of shas, he is an amaoretz. Meaning he has no clue what's going on. He can cite left and right, this and that, but he doesn't have any understanding, any grasp of what he's learning. The, yes? How's that possible? I understand, like, how do you go through it and not get some of a feeling for it along the way? Is how do you not understand it along the way? It all has to do with your mindset. If your mind is warped, twisted, and deficient, it will remain warped, twisted, and deficient. <laughs> That's a bit serious. Yeah. Are we saying that men have the intuition or women have No, the women have more of the intuition. And therefore... Women have more understanding. And That's why once... Let me just explain one thing without you before I forget. That's why Sarah, it says Sarah was greater than Avram in prophecy, in Nevoah. Mm-hmm. Why? Because Nevoah is understanding. It's understanding means extrapolating from a vision which you receive what Ratzon Hashem is. You get this vision, and it's a, it's a riddle, and you have to understand it. A woman 
is more likely to understand it than a man is likely to understand it. Also, a prophecy, of course, has to do with the future. Right? Not with the past. It's to do with the future, you, usually. So therefore, a woman who's more attuned to the future has more of a capacity to understand that than a man does. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. How does it fit at the moron theory? What? How does all of this fit the moron theory? Yeah, so, uh, this, uh, so the, the, the short answer, I will give the long answer, but the short answer is, become, is that men are becoming greater morons and women are becoming less of mor lesser morons. What is the moron theory? Me too. Uh, the moron theory or the moron... Yeah, theory? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. The, the, uh, the moron theory is that it's very, very succinct. Is verily we are truly all morons, meaning that one can't, we cannot grasp what most concepts in Judaism and in true and truth are, because we are all morons. Men and women alike. Men and women alike, Jew, Jew and non-Jew. This is the universal uh, plague of the generation. And the more technology we possess, the greater morons we become except for this small elite, which actually makes money by developing that technology. You mean this generation or all the gen You mean just this one for now? We are the, at the other depths of degradation. Yeah, <laughs> it's been getting worse and worse, but this, we're, we're really scraping bottom. <laughs> yeah, that's why we are the, genera the ADD generation, right? You know, <laughs> okay, there is a corollary of the moron theory which we just came up with last week, which is the, the jerk theory. <laughs> that's all. That's just, but that just pertains to men. What? That's Again, more to men than to women. Positive, like, <laughs> what? There is a positive aspect. Positive in, there's a positive. No, no. The moron theory has a positive side, which is that since we are all morons, we're not impacted upon by evil as much as we would be once. You know, you can't be an evil genius. You can't be an evil genius if you're a moron, right? So, what you're saying is the balance between the yetzer and the yetzer is always balanced. If you're small yetzer and the small yetzer, right? Yeah. Yes. There's actually a movie that came out um, some time ago. That it's, called, it's called Idiocracy. <laughs> Idiocracy? Yeah, this, this, this director basically has this idea that, like, of the movie that basically the world, everyone thinks the world, like, the more scientifically advanced we get, like, everyone's getting smarter and smarter, but his movie was, like, everyone's getting dumber and dumber. Right. So there was this guy that they froze, like, in, like, a certain year, and then they unfroze him, like, seven years ago, and he was, he was, he was like, a normal average guy for that time period. But when they unfroze him, like, you know, like, 200 years later, 300 years later, like, everyone was so stupid, they didn't understand his normal conversations that they had with him. Right. So it was like this whole idea of, like, like everyone's against stupid. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal today how people, this is not, it's only indirectly related, but it's a pretty interesting connection to make, which is how job applicants are, who do well in their interviews are losing their jobs, their the potential positions afterwards because they start texting the, the person who interviewed them. And anybody, when they text with the common mode of texting nowadays, comes off sounding stupid and frivolous. Oh, yeah. Wow. So, um, <laughs> the very mode of communication. You see, there's a generation gap in the mode of communication. Someday people are not going to be able to spell the word R anymore because they've always used just the letter R in order to write the word R. That's where, that's where we're headed. Um, <laughs> right, and if you could type with more than just your thumbs, oh. right, then you'd be able to uh, Teddy B. Shakespeare. The um, anyway, so getting back to um, getting back to uh, learning Torah. So the the idea of learning Torah is twofold. There's learning Torah in order to know what Hashem wants you to do. And in order to know what Judaism is all about. And then there's learning Torah as a purely intellectual activity. For the sake of uh, g gaining knowledge in and of itself. The sake of gaining knowledge in and of itself. That was de de designated specifically for males. Again, because that's the masculine trait. The idea of conquering knowledge goes back to the conquering of the world. 
You conquer the world by conquering its knowledge. And that, again, the learning Torah for the sake of knowing more Torah in and of itself is supposed to be a masculine trait, not a feminine trait. Yeah? But the more knowledge you learn, the more distant you become from the world. The more what? The more you learn. The more distant you become from the world? Well, because you become singular, you become like an entity that is beyond everyone else. You can't really relate to it. No. For example, if you have genius, for example, he can't explain his theory to someone around him, so thus he becomes outside the circle. Well, he probably had that problem before he started. <laughs> In other words, when he was three, he couldn't relate to the world either. It's not a function of ga gathering the knowledge, it's a function of a personality. There are many personalities who are quirky geniuses who can't relate to other people, but I don't think that it's because they amassed the knowledge, but rather because they had the personality. You know, everyone thought that Galileo was crazy, you know, at his age. But now that we see what Galileo's findings were like, this is... Yeah, but if you met him in the street, you'd still think he's crazy. That was the personality. Genius. What? But a crazy genius. Right. Uh, cra we know insanity and genius are related to each other. They're very connected. Yeah. When you say we learn Torah just for uh, the sake of wisdom, does that... Knowledge. I mean knowledge, I'm sorry. Does that, that sounds selfish to me because some people might like just to know for the fact of knowing, like, look how much I know. Right, that's a big danger. So, I'm well, that's why men are much more susceptible to haughtiness than women are. Men have much more of, and if you notice, this is something which is a fascinating phenomenon about men, especially in Judaism, which is by rabbi, we have rabbis, and we have Rav Hagons, and we have Hagon Harav, and we have a Rav Tzadik, and we have a Rebbe, and Admor, Kvok Dushas Adonainu Moreno Rabbeinu. And women are just Chaya, Sora, Sprinza. They don't have all these titles. Why? Because they are not Paolo's Gaiva, like men are. Uh, Haughty people. That's why in the good old days, when men were men, there were no right, there were no titles either, right? Hillel, Shammai, right? Shemaya, Avtalion. This is because of the the generations are becoming lower and lower. The lower the generations, the more titles. Every Rebbe nowadays on every street corner is Kvok to Shazadmor. You have a little shtibel in Mutsi, and he's already Kvok to Shazadmor, Shlita. <laughs> and if you. <laughs> what does that mean in the Kvok means our honor, uh, the honorable, the holy. Adonenu, our master, Morenu, our teacher, Rabbeinu, our rabbi. Someone has the full title? Yeah. yeah. If you open the steeple, if you, you know, that I would always, I, 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 I would, uh, have always dreamt of opening up my own steeple, getting a strimal, a Beckisha, and the white socks. First of all, it's really cool. Uh, you know, I would love to dress like that. And besides that, I have my own town, because be the Beckhoffers come from the town of Beschhofen in Germany. I could be the Beschhofen Rebbe. <laughs> I've always dreamt of doing this. That's why Long Melech was the peak of our like knowledge, but control of ourselves. Long Melech was just let's see. He was the most knowledgeable person in the world ever that ever lived, even greater than Moshe. And, and, and but he wasn't haughty. Yeah, but he did. He was at the end. No, he got haughty. He got messed up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's what it says. You know, he took too many wives and too many got too many horses. Even the Torah says not to because he thought, I'll be okay. He had too much, so he became arrogant. That's the danger. Yeah. What does Shlita mean? Shlita means Shlita means Orech Yomim Tovim Arukin. He should live for a long and good, for days which are long, and, which are good and which are long. That's another name I think I forgot, I forgot to mention. When, when there's also on the other side of the name, there, when, let's say, let's talk about dead people right now. You know, by men, there's Zecher Livracha, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, Zecher Tzadik V'Kadosh Livracha, Zecher Tzadik V'Kadosh Livracha, L'Chaye Ho'olam Abor, there is Nishmoso Begin Zemeromim, there are all sorts of things which you say about the deceased in order to convey how significant he was. By women, you always say, Aleha Shalom. 
May peace be upon her. There's no matter how great she was. And, you know, it's kind of an affront to women, because look, every, every Tom, Dick, and Harry nowadays gets a zatzal, zechot tzadik livrocha, and women don't get that. But the, the, the flip side of that is that that's a man's problem, that men need these titles. Not that the guy who died necessarily needs the title, but I have to give him the title because otherwise I'm not showing enough respect. Yeah? Well, but then, again, the degree of difficulty for a guy to become like a pacham is, is much greater than the, than the degree of difficulty for a woman to be considered, right? It, it's better it is? Be, sure it is. Why? Get yourself a strong little Becca sheet. You'll see how well it works. Great. No, I'm not any different with the Becca sheet. What? I'm not, I wouldn't be any different with the Becca sheet and the Shremo. I understand. You mean? No, I mean for okay. The degree of you mean really different? Yes. Oh, of course. That's true. That's not. That doesn't. That's we're talking about the people who are not doing because they're really different. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're talking about the people who are who fall into this trap of the arrogance which come with knowledge. Well, I'm talking about the guys that are really, really knowledgeable. The degree of difficulty. Of course. Of, yes. For them to be who they are is great. Right. Yeah. Right. But that's what's expected of anyone. But that's the the irony of it is that, that the really great ones in our early history we call by their names. David HaMelech. Nobody says Hagon at Tzadik to Reb David. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. In what, in what way will men have less uh, control over women? Like, like from Amrishim, they said like. Like you have to depend on your husband. So, in what way will be lessened uh, when that, you know when we get closer to redemption? Like, how will that be lessened? Well, if I want to just give one example, uh, we're going to have to continue. We're going to continue tomorrow night. Okay, is that fine? Yeah, okay. Good. So, um, well, I want to give one example, which is that, uh, which is where Rav Shlomo Shlomo Hirsch actually gives, which is Chaim Rabbeinu Gershom. Before Chaim Rabbeinu Gershom, a man could divorce a woman at a whim. He didn't have to have any good reason to do it. Right? If she burnt his soup, he could divorce her. As Chen Rabbein Gershom enacted, it was a decree which was enacted that you can't divorce a woman against her will. You have to have her consent before you divorce her. Does that decree end off at any point? Is that like only a certain amount of time? No. Really? There are those who say it was only for a certain amount of time, but Klai so clearly was Makabalat for all time. Oh. And it's still, it's still on the books. The similarly, by Ashkenazim, Ashkenazim, not the Sephardim, were Makabal, the Takon of Rabbeinu Gershom, not to marry more than one wife. So it, you, you see already back in the 1400s, and 1400s, and to the 1000s, you see that there's already this, so to speak, progression towards a time when women are going to have more, so to speak, equality to men. Like that, like women I haven't gone into that yet. We'll come to that. Okay. I'm, I've, I'm not finished with learning Torah issue. Okay. Yeah. Okay? So, the, so for um, many, many thousands of years, it wasn't just in Jewish society. It was also in secular society. Women were primarily ignorant, right? The overwhelming majority of women were ignorant, many, if not most women, were illiterate, and they weren't expected to know very much at all, nor did they generally aspire to know very much. That was regarded as men's domain, not their domain. This was true till the middle of the 19th century. The middle of the 19th century was the time, the turning point. And it's important to know that the Zohar says, it's very important and famous Zohar, in the, in the year 600, which we understand to mean 5,600, in the year uh, 5,600, which is 1840, who knows what the Zohar says? Yeah, the gates of, uh, of knowledge will open. Not, well, not the gates of knowledge. Gates of knowledge will open. Not, not knowledge. Oh, Bina. Bina. The gates swings of Bina will be opened. Shari Bina. Bina. Bina will be opened, yes. Um, I thought that was an industrial revolution out there. Sorry? I thought people say Zohar was talking about Absolutely. That's That's, yes. Oh. Isn't it? I don't know. I saw any before. You had all the raw materials before. All of a sudden, they started making them into steam engines. Right? What happened? They didn't understand. They didn't make them the steam engines earlier. 
It was a, 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 a bina. It was a special understanding. Does that, that mean we lost Torah and they took it? What? That mean we, we no. Lost? We also had bina and Torah. No, no, no. Bina and Torah also began. There would be the yeshiva system of learning, which is an analytical and uh, 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 perhaps even we could say scientific form of learning developed after 1840 for the most part. <laughs> it happened, the Reb Tzodik says, as he saw it many times, the same hashbag, which comes down from Shamayim to the nations, comes down to the Jews, and vice versa. It's just that it manifests itself one way by us and another way by them. I thought they were talking about if we don't do our, enough Torah, then they grab it. They get the, they grab no, it's not a zero-sum game. No? No. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's an influence that comes from Shamayim, and you, it comes down to everybody. How did the Zohar know this? I don't know. They had Ruach HaKodesh, I assume. <laughs> I mean, that they, uh, there are people who knew the secrets, plans of God. You know, it was a page in the Vilna Gons commentary on Safra Ditsniusa. I have it at home. And the Vilna Gons says on this page, he says, Now that you read what I just wrote, you know in what year the redemption is going to come. But I pledge you. I make you swear that you will not reveal this to anybody else. Now, the thing is, if you, I have looked at this page many times. I could not figure out for the life of me what is flying that to know what he's saying that they'll have to worry about the pledge. But there were people who, you know, were functioning on this plane of reality, which is way above and beyond where we're functioning today. I tell th- you what, we can't know. Or a person can't know in the end. It's only God knows. How, how's it going? Or, or, uh, Nobody knows for sure. Many people who made mistakes. The going, who made a mistake? I don't know if someone made a mistake. I don't understand what he's saying. <laughs> How am I supposed to know? The Ramban made a mistake, yes. What? The Ramban made a mistake. The people figure out what, what, what time he said? He said sometime in the 1200s. Really? Yeah, 1290, I think. Wow. Where yeah. is that in spirit? So in the spirit? Well, I know, it's not in the parish. It's somewhere in one of his other farms. I forget which one. Wow. I think it's in one of his, it's Russia for Russia, Sean or something like that. One of the other farms. Uh, a, a date in which the redemption is anticipated. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here now. I'll take questions, but we'll continue with this theme tomorrow night. Any questions for now? Uh, I mean, can you pledge to us, Glenetta, that at the end of uh, at this series, you're going to give your Dafka Das bottom line view on uh, on the question: Are women by Torah, not on your view, but by Torah, not that your view doesn't count, but by Torah, it doesn't equal <laughs> equal to uh, men in uh, sure. In, I'll uh, try. Not at, at the same level, but equal in the same. I'll try. Okay. okay. All right, boys. Have a good night. See you tomorrow.